Oh, uh -huh. sure. Yeah, it was. Uh, I was actually working quite a bit at that time when um, they called me, and um, I, I had a, a good friend in Roy McCurdy. He was the drummer with uh, Cannonball Adderley. And he's actually the one that got me that gig. And uh, a couple months before, we worked at the same club opposite one another for a while. And uh, they would come through, and, and I would be in the house band. He would be with Cannonball Adderley. And Joe's Island who was in that band. That's how he was able to set it up. And so he said, well, you know, we got to get you out of this, this city. You know, you, have to, you should be out playing. And I said, oh, okay, great. He said, you want to play with Frank Zappa, or you want to play with the Weather Report? And I was like, mm, I don't know. I think I would like to play with Weather Report. <laughs> and then I forgot about it. And a couple months later, the phone rang, and I was in the shower. And uh, my mother-in-law at the time took the message, and then I came out of the shower, and she said, like, uh, the weatherman called. The weatherman. I was like, the weatherman. And then it dawned on me that it was from the question that Roy asked me about who I wanted to play with. So she said, well, and I was like, oh, no, I missed the call. And uh, she said they'll call back in 20 minutes. And the next day I was in in L.A. Wow. But I had to play that night because I couldn't get anybody to take my place. So I stayed up all night. I got the flight out and then ended up being in L.A. early afternoon with my drums and everything. And um, the roadies picked me up at the airport in a truck <laughs> and then took me to this <laughs> recording studio. And you recorded played, already. And I played Thursday. eight hours that day. Wow. And that ended up being the stuff that's on the, um, the tune, Mysterious Traveler. It was me and another drummer was already there. I didn't know there would be another drummer there, but they had already been rehearsing the tunes. So he had the basic thing laid down. He had a big set, 24-inch bass drum, big toms and stuff. And I had, I thought I was doing like the kind of stuff that Eric Gravatt and Alphonse Muzan had done in the band. So I had brought my little drums. I had 18-inch bass, you know, like a jazz kind of kid, yeah. high-pitched. So I played those notes in between what the other guy played, which were the big lower notes. And that's what you hear in the recording. That's good. So it was wild. So I did those 10 days. And uh, Joe Zalin was very demanding at some times and very friendly at other times. So I, I had a really good time. And I learned a lot from that experience. And then like when it was over the next day, I was back. And I was, I think, the uh, next week I was with Jimmy Smith, the organist. So I was doing a lot of work, but it was really different than the weather report stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. That was like December of 70, 1973. Yeah, the first book that I did, I was very lucky, because I went back to school for um, my master's in, in Statyaniti. Uh, like high school and college and then masters and then doctor. And so I went back to get uh, to prove that I could read a book and, and uh, be a, a student again. And my final project for the masters, it's called the master's thesis, was this book. And I, so I wrote a book, a drum book. And uh, the guy that was the sign-off guy, you know, like you you hand in your project yeah. and your teachers. That, he wasn't a drummer or anything. He was, was a master's for education. So he said, geez, the only drummer I know is I ever, I don't know any drummers. I only know Louis Belson. I said, fine. Louis Belson will sign off on this book. Is that good? Because I knew, I knew Louis Belson. He had been helpful to me a couple different times. And, um, and so that, that, that solved it. And then I turned in the project, and three weeks later, I happened to meet Sandy Feldstein, who was a, a really nice guy and really helpful to me, like a mentor, and uh, as he had been for, for many different people. But he was um, a publisher. He was also a player and um, president in the Percussive Arts Society, all that kind of stuff. And I happened to meet him, and I said, would you spend some time? And so he said, I have 15 minutes, and I showed him my book. and. They took the book. That was it. He was the only guy I showed the book to. And that company, CPP Bellman, ended up being Warner Brothers. And Warner Brothers got bought by Alfred. And so 
that book, Coral Fusion Drumming, started out as the beat, the body, and the brain. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, 20 years later, that book is still available. That was the first one. The books you can check out on the uh, website or on the, uh, we'll have a little picture of this so you can check it out. And then I did another one later in the 90s about the broken eighth note feel, which is like a jazz feel that's based on uh, eighth notes, kind of like Tony Williams, Roy Haynes, Jack DeJunette, and uh, Ewan Christensen, where uh, I'm going to play a little bit now. So the more normal jazz stuff is built on triplets where it's but this other feel that started like in the early 60s and was a holdover from like uh, Boogaloo and the Shingling stuff like that uh, like pop grooves from um, R&B records was based on eighth notes so that the feel started getting flatter yeah, at all tempos, not just like 150 and above or something, but... So the whole style ended up being based on eighth notes, not triplets. And then so guys were interested in that here, so I did the book and then for... I don't know, 15 years or so we did that class. And that's what that, that book was for that class. And you can still get the book. But it's all based on all those guys that have played that style right up through now with Billy Stewart and um, Eric Harland, all those guys that play the straight eighth note feel as, as well as the swing swing stuff. That's what uh, the jazz stuff is called by Eric Harland and uh, Jeff Watts, all that stuff that's pretty much all triplets. This other style is the balancing force to that. And then the last book was one we did for the um, Jazz Drum Styles class, and that was this Profiles in Jazz Drumming book. And it's like covers the 13 different drummers, at least in this first edition, of drummers from 1960 to 2005. And it's bio-information, tips on their style, transcriptions that um, uh, Fabio Preazzolo did on there so that the tunes you can break them down and see and you can hear them uh, in real time or slowed down so you can get an idea of what guys are doing. And that was the required text for the drum styles class. Yeah, so those four books and now I'm working on uh, this book, second edition. So kind of like the follow-up to that new uh, Danny Gottlieb book, The Evolution of Jazz Drumming. This will cover from the 60s, like this did, but more guys. Less stuff, more guys. Yeah, as a player, I think what's happened here at school is there's music business, music therapy, and um, music production and engineering, and uh, also you also have to learn every, regardless of what instrument you play, you have to learn keyboard and harmony. And for drummers, it's real important to get that together. You know, therapy is kind of an alternative for, uh, like a gig for not just playing, but being able to help people uh, with music in a different way. But any of those other facets, the music business and um, MP&E, the music production and engineering, because now you need to be able to do that like we're doing our own videos now and our own recording for the music we play. And you're putting it on your website and I saw the one where you have the stuff with your brother. Yeah, everything is self-produced nowadays. Right. And so it's a piece of it. You just can't go and like play with your friends and then, I mean, maybe you can, but I, I think it's harder and harder now to do that sort of thing. But I think the big piece is knowing keyboards also so that you know what's going on in the music like everybody else. Not that you have to play, but if nothing else, to help to improve your hearing so yeah. you know where everything is. So do you need training and harmony studies? Right. Well, that was the idea behind the styles classes, that you had to be able to know where you were in the songs. So I would play songs for people and like stop and say, what measure are we in? Remember, you, we did that when you were in the class. Yeah, that's true. 
<laughs> is it a blues? Oh, oh. Yeah. 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 So the idea was that you knew just from, even in the bass solo where the song was, you could hear yeah. what was going on. In and that helps you to help everybody else play better. And if people are comfortable with your playing, they're comfortable with hiring you. Kind of like works together. So that would be the big piece, I think, would be learning keyboard and harmony, the music business and the music production and engineering, any of the software stuff that you would be able to do. Pro Tools and... Or uh, Logic, or whatever it is, the one that like, school now uses a uh, digital... Performer. Yeah, something like that. So that you can help to reproduce your own stuff, at least where you can demonstrate that you can do something with uh, the music on another level. Yeah. The more prepared they are, the less you need to pay somebody else to do it. Uh, sometimes I get questions about how you can access that feel for the broken eighth note feel. It's a jazz feel that started like in the early 60s where uh, it came more from like the R&B kinds of feels like boogaloo, that moved more into the James Brown stuff, things like that, or shingling, some dances that were happening. But one of the ways that I was able to do it much later, I started playing this feel much later, like in the 70s, was um, by accessing the, the feel from Brazil for like samba, where you had just... How that fits with the sambas, it's kind of like the same kind of feel of those eighth notes playing. That sort of thing, but without the ostinato with the bass drum. So you might be familiar with hearing a little bit tighter with that bass drum feel, which is. And now we're playing with. being like the same rhythm that would have been in the samba for And that's all with that original alternating sticking that I played on the hi-hat, just with some different density, some dynamics with the left hand around the drum set. And then the rest of the time keeping that 3 8 note ride happening on there. In the book it's broken down to start using more complicated stickings with now doubles instead of just singles. So we, we play. We have now the basic feel.
and then we can start orchestrating those stickings with other sound sources in combination. So if we were to put the bass drum with the right hand on the cymbal out of those doubles, it sounds like this. together put the bass drum in between and you can use those as like fills or start combining those in with keeping the time like using as a teka like the basic time keeping kind of uh, rhythm <laughs> First again, again, that's just the alternating, but now I put the bass drum with the right hand out of that alternating. And if we speed it up and we put those combinations of singles to get and, and doubles together. <laughs> The idea is that the basic vocabulary is just singles and doubles in combinations with different orchestrations around your body and the drum set. And then you end up with things like if you listen to early Jack DeJohnette with Charles Lloyd, Keith Jarrett from the mid-60s, Tony Williams, Roy Haynes, the 70s with Yoon Christensen with uh, Keith Jarrett, you'll hear these kinds of combinations. At the beginning, it's all consecutive, and then after a while, it can be more open, more spacey. Guys from this century now, and then the 90s, Billy Stewart, Jochen Ruckart's another great master at this, uh, Ian Froman, guy that also teaches here, and uh, Jimmy Haddad, and um, but there's just lots and lots of guys doing this style now. Tony Martucci's another guy maybe you haven't heard of, but he's a really good a really good player. <laughs>